Hello and welcome to this service for Pentecost Sunday, which is being broadcast on behalf of Bolton Methodist Church. Today we finish our series on the fruits of the Spirit from Galatians, and we are going to be looking at being strong and patient, or gentle and patient, depending on how you want to read it. Today is Pentecost Sunday, the day the Spirit was given and the Church begun in Jerusalem just nearly 2,000 years ago. And we're going to celebrate that fact as well as listen to teaching on the topic of today's service. One of the words that is used for the arrival of the Spirit is power or strength. And so we're going to begin by singing together, Strength Will Rise As We Wait Upon the Lord. Lord, we will wait upon the Lord, we will wait. 
so let's pray. Lord, open our eyes that we might be witnesses to your fingerprints on every part of your creation. Open our ears that we might tell of the song at the heart of all things. Open our lips that we so that we will not be silent, but sing a song of your glory. Open our hearts that we might worship the Lord of glory with every fibre of our being. For we are here to worship you, Lord, for your greatness and glory demand our praise. Amen. And so we reflect on that greatness as we sing Father of Everlasting Grace. So we pray. There's a response to these prayers. After I say, move in us, Lord, please feel free to answer out loud or in the silence of your heart. Move in us, we pray. Mighty God, we remember this day with awe and wonder, the events of that day of Pentecost long ago, which so transformed the lives of the apostles. Move in us, Lord. Move in us, we pray. We remember how in the space of a few moments their experience was revolutionised, their expectations turned upside down, their attitude changed forever. 
One moment consumed by fear, the next radiating confidence. One moment uncertain of the future, the next sure of their calling. One moment wrestling with doubt, the next full of faith. One moment hiding behind locked doors, the next preaching boldly to the crowds. Move in us, Lord. Move in us, we pray. Mighty God, you came through your Spirit, and life was never the same again. Come to us, breathing new fire into our hearts, new energy into our lives, new life into our souls. Transform our fear, anxiety and doubt, filling us with confidence and faith. Open our minds to new horizons, new experiences and a new way of looking at life. So may we live by the Spirit, bearing rich fruit to your glory. Move in us, Lord. Move in us, we pray. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And we take a moment to consider those things we need to confess to God today for his forgiveness, his cleansing and his healing. And in this prayer, after I say the words, Lord, have mercy, would you answer, Lord, have mercy. Living God, we have rejoiced again today at the gift of your spirit, the way you breathed new hope, new faith and new life into your people. But we remember also that not everyone responded so gladly to the Spirit's coming. From some there was scorn, ridicule and disbelief, suggestions that the apostles were drunk or even out of their minds. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Living God, forgive us too that we can be guilty of a similar response. Instead of welcoming the Spirit, we greet him with cautious and suspicious hearts. Instead of opening our lives to the Spirit's movement, we close our minds to anything which challenges our long-held perceptions. Instead of gladly receiving your Spirit's gifts, we barricade our souls against change. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Loving God, you warn us to test what we think is the Spirit and ensure it is of you. And there are times when we need to do that, when it's right to be aware of misplaced enthusiasm and false prophecy. Yet save us from ever quenching, obstructing or frustrating the Spirit. Forgive us all the times we have done that, and open our lives now to your Holy Spirit's life-giving breath, so that we may live more truly as your people. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. In the name of Christ. Amen. Our scripture reading today is part of Paul's second letter written to his young apprentice, Timothy, from chapter 1 and beginning at verse 3. I thank God whom I serve as my ancestors did with a clear conscience, as night and day I constantly remember you in my prayers. Recalling your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you too. For this reason I remind you to fan into flame the flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For the Spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love and self-discipline. So do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord Jesus Christ, or of me, his prisoner. Rather, join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. He has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Jesus Christ before the beginning of time, but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Saviour Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and brought life and immortality to light through the Gospel. And of this Gospel I was appointed a herald and an apostle and a teacher. 
that is why I am suffering as I am, yet this is no cause for shame, because I know whom I have believed, and am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. What you have heard from me, keep as the pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Christ Jesus. Guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. Thanks be to God. And so we sing again before we listen to our word for today. And in the, we sing the, the hymn, Speak, O Lord, as we come to you. Pentecost, the day the Spirit came, a day that had been promised by Jesus when he told his friends to wait in Jerusalem for the coming of the Spirit, a day that had been announced by John the Baptist who said that Jesus was the one who would come and baptise with the Spirit as he had himself baptised people with water, a day prophesied hundreds of years before by Jeremiah and Joel and others who spoke about the spirit that would come to change the hearts and minds of people. And on the day of Pentecost, there was the sound of the power of a mighty wind. In the Bible, wind is, is described by the word ruach, which can also mean breath. It's the word that is used in Genesis when Adam is made from the, the clay of the ground and God breathes life into him and he becomes a living soul. So Pentecost is a day of new creation, a day when Christians are first made, a new kind of human with a live connection to God and a life that comes from him. There were living flames touching each person, reminiscent of the fiery coals from the altar in the temple with which Isaiah's mouth was cleansed, making him holy in God's service. A symbol of the dunamis, the power, the power for all, with gifts for all, which divides and comes to each person, giving them the ability of the Spirit as the Spirit wills, empowering all of them, energising the whole community together to demonstrate the reality of God. And today we are the heirs, the inheritors of those same gifts. God 
breathes into us his ruach to make us fully alive. God bestows on us his dunamis, the power to serve him with the gifts that the Spirit brings. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't it exciting? Isn't it true? Or is it daunting, terrifying, threatening? Something perhaps we want to leave to the Charismatics and the Pentecostals, not for serious Methodists at all. But actually, there is no church that is not Charismatic and Pentecostal. Because church without the leading, guiding, gifting and energising of the Spirit is not church. So today is a reminder to all of us that we have to open our hearts, minds and lives to the Holy Spirit if we want to be Christian people, if we want to be the Church of Jesus Christ. We have to move past our fear, our doubts, our prejudices, our limitations, our low expectations and allow God to be at work in us and through us. Otherwise, these last seven Sundays have been a nonsense. How can we have the fruit of the Spirit, the character and nature of God and of his Son, growing in us if we have not welcomed and let loose God in our lives? The answer is, we can't. So we need to do something about it. So Paul writes to Timothy, his young apprentice, You have the Spirit with you and your own parcel of gifts because I laid hands on you and prayed for God to give them to you and you received them. So fan the embers, he says, of that initial fire into flame. How? By recognising your gifts and using them, by welcoming the spirit of God's power and letting him work through you. Paul writes that the spirit that God gives us is powerful, is loving and inspires sound judgment. Those are good things. The Spirit doesn't inspire fear. That's not God. The Spirit doesn't make us timid, afraid, ashamed, embarrassed or any other negative emotion. That's not God. The Spirit inspires energy, passion, hope and life and all the other qualities we've looked at over these last weeks. That is God. And so today we remember that the Spirit grows our patience and our gentleness. The Spirit does this by allowing us to wait for results and placing us in situations where we have to choose gentleness over harshness. We need to remember that God doesn't work in a hurried time frame. God is not concerned with right now. Even if we are, God does things at the right time. The New Testament even uses two different words for God. There is the word chronos, clock time, although clocks hadn't been invented when that word was being used, but the time that passes minute by minute and day by day. And there is a different kind of time called kairos, the right moment, the God moment, when all things are ready, when God has positioned all of his ducks in a row, and this is purposeful time rather than passing time. We can't confuse the two. Patience enables us to deal with passing time so that we can wait for that purposeful time. Patience might be an unfashionable word and virtue in a fast-paced instant world, but quality doesn't come quickly. It requires time and patience. And patience grows through having to be patient. There are in the Bible, particularly in the Psalms, many encouragements to wait for the Lord. Waiting doesn't mean doing something passively. It means trusting. It means expecting. It means looking to see what God will do and when. We aren't doing nothing while we wait. We get on with the business of loving God, neighbour and ourselves with all our full commitment, all of our heart, soul, mind and strength. But we don't do it alone. We do it in partnership with the Spirit, waiting for him to prompt us, to initiate an action or a change, to give us an intuitive word of knowledge or wisdom or some revelation or inspiration about what we should do. 
patience grows as we wait for God, and we do that confidently and expectantly. Patience also grows through difficult circumstances that require us to be patient. In old-fashioned language, these would be called trials and tribulations. There's a story, which I'm sure it was made up, it couldn't have been genuine, about a woman who went to see her minister and said, Pastor, I need you to pray for me. I need more patience. So he asked her to kneel and he laid his hands on her head <clears throat> and he said, Lord God, please give this, my sister tribulation and give her it in great amounts. She stopped him and she said, no, no, that's not what I asked for. I wanted patience, not trouble. And he said, but the Bible says the tribulation worketh patience. The woman wanted patience, but that only develops by having to get through whatever is going on. Patience isn't passivity. It's endurance of a situation until a resolution comes through. Patience, in fact, is a power. It's a strength. It stops you being ground down by the pitfalls and pressures and problems of life. And as Paul has told us, the Holy Spirit is a spirit of power. And then there's gentleness. And gentleness expresses some of that sound judgment that Paul wrote to Timothy about. Gentleness is not softness. Sometimes you have to be really quite firm to be gentle. When a doctor has to replace a dislocated shoulder, it isn't going to be done by just stroking the shoulder or moving the arm gently. There comes a point where pressure has to be put on and the, limb, the arm has to be pulled in order for the shoulder to re-engage. It is done as gently as possible to get the work done. Gentleness is strength. Many years ago on a family holiday, we went to Cheddar Gorge to the visitor centre and outside one of the huts there was a potter's wheel. For a small fee, you could sit at the potter's wheel in the full gaze of all the other visitors and have a go at turning a pot. I was given a lump of clay. <clears throat> it was a little bit squidgy. It was a little bit wet. And I thought, oh, this is going to be easy. I put the clay in the centre of the wheel <clears throat> and then started the wheel running. And then I tried to shape it. That was when I discovered that clay is not soft and pliable. Clay is what the Americans call ornery, awkward. You have to be gentle with it. You can guide it. You can shape it but you can't be soft with it. If you're soft with it, it does its own thing. It goes out of shape. It goes every which way except where you want it to go. There has to be just the right firmness and just the right gentleness to make sure that the clay does what is needed. Gentleness is the right application of just the right amount of strength to change or resolve a situation or to shape a particular outcome. We can be gentle with our words. We can correct people, but we don't have to crush them. We can encourage them rather than condemn them. Gentle words can turn a situation, avoid a situation. Someone once described it as verbal Aikido, using that ability to turn other people's energy or anger in such a way that it becomes a power to change a situation. We can be gentle in our actions applying just the right amount of pressure or direction in the right place at the right time in order to make something happen. Gentleness has to be judged. Enough strength, but not too much. I remember going to see a chiropractor once and asked, asked them to work on my neck. So he laid me down on his couch he sat behind me and he held his head in my hands. And suddenly, with a firm hand, he twisted my neck and my head. Appropriate force, just enough, not too little. Too little and nothing would have happened. Too much, he'd have broken my neck. The right amount, the right gentleness, allowed him to free up the, the bones in my neck and give me more movement and less pain. Gentleness means knowing when to speak and when to be silent. It isn't always necessary that people need to hear what we have to say, or sometimes it's just not the right time. 
To be gentle, we need to be guided by the spirit of sound judgment so that we get things right. And so, like patience, our skill in applying power through gentleness develops by our, ongo our ongoing experience. We see and we feel the effects of ungentle words and actions all around us, the conflict and the hurt, the result of harshness, judgmentalism and criticism, and we can bring the opposite to bear. By looking at that, we learn the benefits of moderation, humility and self-awareness. We discover the need to be gentle through working out our own issues and blind spots, our own need for forgiveness, both given and received. Gentleness grows when we recognise that none of us is yet perfect, but that through following the Spirit's guidance, through our life experiences and faith experiences, we are all making progress. So it is that God makes us grow in his image and likeness, in that character and those virtues we call holiness. In the end, that is our highest achievement and our ultimate goal. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said to his followers, and therefore to us, be like your heavenly Father. The nine characteristics we call the fruit of the Spirit are the, base, are the best description we have of that likeness. As we increasingly open ourselves to the leadership and inspiration of the Spirit, let's do it in anticipation and expectation, that through doing so, the character of God will be ever more clearly etched in our works and our words. Amen. Having sat together and listened for God's word to us today, we're going to spend just a couple of minutes now looking at some photographs with music to help us to reflect on what we've heard and what it might mean for us. Now we sing together the song, Teach Me to Dance to the Beat of Your Heart, as we say yes to God's invitation to live for him in the power of his spirit.
And so we come to pray for the church, for the world, for ourselves and our neighbours, and for those in need of God's help. Again, the prayers are responsive, and after the words, the Lord is here, the response is, his spirit is with us. Holy Spirit, giver of all good gifts, come into our darkness as light. Come as the wind to refresh and uplift us. Come as joy to disperse our sorrows. Come as power to enable us and encourage us. Come as love and revive your church, that we may show and share your gifts, that we may reach out in love through your grace. The Lord is here. His Spirit is with us. Come Holy Spirit, direct our rulers, fill our leaders with talent and discernment, inspire our artists and musicians, writers and craftspeople. Come Spirit of God, give peace and unity to the nations, come renew the face of the earth. By His Spirit the Lord is here, His Spirit is is with us. Come Holy Spirit, fill our homes, set our hearts on fire with the warmth of your love. Come stir our minds and inspire us to do new things. Guide us in our relationships with each other and draw us together in your fellowship of love and joy. The Lord is here, his Spirit is with us. We come with all who are weary, all whose hope has dried up. We come with the despairing, the despondent, and all who are dispirited, with the depressed and oppressed peoples of our world. We pray for all who have become very weak, for all who are infirm and cannot cope on their own. O Spirit of God, stir up your power and come among us. Spirit of God, you breathe life into dry bones. You give new life to your people. We pray for our loved ones departed, asking that they will be kept by your Spirit in your presence and peace. The Lord is here. His Spirit is with us. Come, Holy Spirit, come upon us. Come around us. Come within us. Come to lead us. Come to guide us that we may work in your power and rest in your presence through our Lord Jesus Christ who taught us when we pray to say together Our Father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Now, a prayer of thanksgiving. We thank you, Holy Spirit of God, sharing in all creation from the very beginning of space, time and matter. We thank you, by whom Mary was chosen, Jesus was born and anointed and filled. He embraced suffering and death and was glorified. The church was born. We thank you, Holy Spirit of God, for life transformed and made new, for old thoughts giving way to new dreams, old ways giving place to the new life in Christ, old sins giving way to new graces, Old caution giving way to new courage, old fears giving way to new confidence. We thank you that your new life amongst the first disciples, for Peter, James and John, transformed by you. We thank you for the new life amongst the next followers in Paul and Barnabas and Timothy. We thank you for the long succession of followers and saints stretching down the ages, all made new by your power. We thank you for those who trained us in the faith and called us to that new life. Holy Spirit, ever making life anew, the living power of Christ within us, come claim us for yourself. 
yours we are now and every day for the rest of our lives and into eternity thanks be to god amen so our final hymn is god's spirit is in my heart he has called me and set me apart God's Spirit is in my heart, He has called me and set me apart. This is what I have to do, what I have to do. so to bless one another and to end our worship we share in the words of the prayer we call the grace may the grace of our lord jesus christ and the love of god and the fellowship of the holy spirit be with us all evermore amen may the holy spirit inspire you move you and go with you as you move into this new week goodbye <laughs>